Welcome to Like It Is. In this edition, our sole guest will be Hank Jones, who's now 80 years old, and younger than ever, musically. Stay with us. Don't pour no water on me, just let me burn. <laughs> Ray Noble. One of Ray Noble's compositions. How, how long have you been uh, developing that arrangement? Well, I suppose off and on for a number of years, although actually I play it pretty much now the way I did the very first time I played it. You know? uh, it's just that I may have added a few chords here and there, another chorus. Usually I play when I go into the uh, ad lib section after mm -hmm. the melody. Mm -hmm. Usually I play it much longer but that depends on the spot that I have the time available sure. for that spot. But it's pretty much the same. It's, it's over a period of maybe 75 or 80 years. Uh, uh. <coughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, well, <laughs> not, not quite that long.
you have um, you come from a musical family. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Well, you know, everybody uh, uh, immediately thinks when they think of uh, the Joneses, they, they think of uh, Thad, uh, Elvin, and myself. Actually, I had two sisters who also played piano. Really? And um, all of my sisters sang. I had four sisters, five sisters, and they all sang. But two of them played piano. And one was a very fine pianist at an early age, at the age of about... 12, 12 and a half, uh, she was playing concerts wow. in the local schools and churches. And uh, she was very uh, advanced for a 12 year old. She had an unfortunate accident, though she died while skating, ice skating on a lake. But uh, she was a very accomplished she pianist. She fell through the early. ice? Mm -hmm. Fell through the ice? Yes, yeah, so it was in the spring, and I think the ice had uh, softened in the area where they were. And a bunch of kids, they didn't, they didn't realize that they were on the thin ice or that the ice was. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And she fell through, and she was caught in an undercurrent under the lake, uh, underneath the surface of the lake, and she was drowned. Oh, my. Uh, but, uh... uh Where was this? Other, this was in Pontiac, Michigan. Mm -hmm. See, I grew up in Pontiac, which is a suburb of Detroit, about 25 miles north of Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, which one of your parents uh, was proficient in music, or did it come from elsewhere? Both of my parents were amateur musicians. They were not professional. Uh, my father played a little guitar, uh, sort of in the T-Bone Walker style, you know, with right. behind the neck, you know. <laughs> and my mother played uh, piano, but not professionally. And uh, as I said, they were both amateur musicians, but uh, there was always music around the house. We had a, a player piano. When nobody felt like playing the piano, we would just <laughs> use the pedals, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> but th that was the the first piano that I was aware of in the house was a player piano. And, you know, you can learn a lot from playing, from listening to a player piano. Really? You can. Because you, if you listen to the keys, by even watching the keys, as the keys are depressed and because of the American mechanism, you can use, you can find out what the bass notes are that the pianist is playing. And you can get an idea of how to coordinate the right hand with the left hand to play stride piano. Oh. So I think that you can learn from that. And so they had um, on these player pianos uh, the music of the day, uh, yes. as far as uh, as far as African American music is concerned. Mm. Well, I know that uh, musicians like uh, Fats Waller made some piano rolls. Uh, James P. Johnson made uh, a number of piano rolls. Uh, I see. Other pianists of the day made piano rolls, and they played. Uh, I think the currently popular jazz selections of the day. And perhaps some also pop selections as well, you know. <laughs> well, when did uh, things change for the, uh, this old tired pun, the Jones boys? W and there was a decision made to turn professional. Uh, who made the first move and at what age? Well, since I was the eldest, some people say the oldest, but I like to say the eldest. You know. <laughs> I was the more the male of members of the family. Um, I think I probably made the first uh, move. That is, I left Pontiac and went uh, uh, to a very far away country, which was around roughly about 40 miles to the north of us. Uh, at that time, it seemed like a great distance to me. <laughs> Flint, Michigan. However, from that point, I uh, left and came back uh, again towards Detroit. After I left Detroit, I spent some time in Cleveland, Ohio. But were uh, you playing in all these yes. cities mm. professionally? Yes. Uh -huh. That is, I was being paid. Weekly, very weekly. However, it was the start. I see. And, you know, the difference between professional and amateur is only that if you're an amateur, you don't get paid at all. If you're a professional, you get paid something, but not enough, you know. <laughs> okay. We don't have enough time uh, to continue in this segment, so let's take another break. Okay. And we'll be back with more of Hank Jones. A Michigan area, but what happened in home base, Pontiac, th that made you decide that this is what you wanted to do? <laughs> well, I, maybe the most significant thing that happened in Pontiac was that there was no work there, you know, so you had to leave in order to further your ambitions or to further your objectives or whatever they were in music. But you got but gigs in Pontiac. I, I worked a little in Pontiac. You know, when I worked in Pontiac, this goes back to the days of uh, Prohibition, or shortly after, actually, uh, uh, there was, there were beer gardens, what they called beer gardens, at, in those days. 
there were establishments where you could buy 3.2 beer. But that was meant that the content of the alcohol in the beer was 3.2, you know. And, of course, these places were always filled to capacity. And many people augmented the alcohol content of their, in their drinks by having a flask or two either on the hip or in the pocket, you know. So that 3.2 uh, alcoholic percentage was never really uh, adhered to uh, significantly. However, that's where I used to play. Now, there were all kinds of little groups, trios, uh, quartets. I played uh, with a duo uh, at one time. Usually they were a trio, which consisted of piano, bass, and drums. Right. And uh, that's how I first began to play. Uh, what kind of sound were you uh, achieving then, and who were you listening to? At that time, there were pianists. Uh, the pianists that I heard most, uh, of course, on records, were Fats Waller, uh, Earl Hines, Duke Ellington, um, various blues pianists. Uh, I guess that's about it. You know, you, you, there weren't that many. At least I didn't have access to that many recordings of uh, pianists. Well, who jumped out at you among that that group you mentioned? Would, would it be Fats? Fats and perhaps Earl Hines, because Earl, I heard more Earl Hines at that time than Fats. Later, I began to hear more Fats Muller records, and maybe five or six years later. Can you give me an example of the difference between the two styles of Fats? Well, Earl Hines had a what they call a, a single line style, single finger style. Um, he played, for instance, if he played a song like Rosetta, he would play. Thumb line. So he had a very heavy thumb line, you know. Right. was more or less typical of Earl Hines. And Fats? Fats Waller would uh, start out by playing something like, um, please don't talk about me when I'm trying to say. It's that so was poor. typical Fats Waller. He uh, used a lot of stride, as you've probably noticed, and uh, a very active right hand, which he... Uh, the, bass, the bass indicates, really, the chord that you play with the right hand. Or you can say it the other way. The right hand could dictate the bass note. Usually, the bass line dictates whatever you play in the right hand. Right. Now, the stride technique, what does that really involve? Is it the, well, the, it the rhythm that you're talking about, or is it the intervals that you're talking about? that uh, you have to reach with your hand. Partly hands. both. Well, actually, you, you can play stride with just uh, an octave in the left hand. Is that so, so? Yes. In fact, many of the pianists, mm. I've heard some uh, ladies who weren't able to stretch a tenth just play with the left hand, uh, play octave with the left hand. They might say, uh, in that same uh, example, Maybe just one note in the bass hand, but the bass note followed by a, a corresponding chord, also in the left hand, uh, combined with the melody in the right hand. But Fats wasn't doing that. He no, was Fats was playing tenths in the left hand. So he would sometimes he would run the tenths in that fashion. I mean. Now, <laughs> now, wait a minute. These, these intervals that you're hitting with your left hand aren't that easy to reach. Well, uh, for, I guess, most pianists who play solo a great deal, except people who are physically unable to stretch a uh, tenth, it's fairly easy, you know. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know. I'm sure with your fingers you could stretch 20 notes with your left hand. You know? well, no, I, the, I, the hand was broken several years ago, <laughs> and I haven't really been able to. <laughs> But um, what did you do? You, you combined some of these styles in your playing? Or? Well, 
I, I suppose you could. You, you. I suppose you could say. I, I suppose that what your whatever your style is today. Let's say uh, any pianist who plays solo today, his style is probably. I say probably because this is not not necessary to a distillation or an amalgamation or an amalgam of various things that he's heard and that he has adapted during the course of, ex of his experience. Uh, uh, it, it's not necessarily true. For instance, uh, a pianist, <coughs> for instance, like Earl Garner, who developed a style which was quite different from any other style that I've heard. When I first heard Earl, by the way, he was playing stride this way. Is that a fact? Right, and then later on he began to just use, use, just use, use a chordal left hand right. accompaniment, you know. <coughs> And not necessarily tense either, by the way. Right. But that's he changed his style quite a bit. Mm -hmm. On 52nd Street, I might add, you know. So, so you um, sort of borrowed from here, borrowed from there. I think that's what everybody does in a sense. And you, you're not even conscious that you're doing it. You know, see, I think there's, there's a process called uh, selection. And uh, you edit. Uh, you, you listen to things that, 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 that you like. Uh, not maybe maybe you don't like them, but if you if you do like them, uh, you adapt whatever you like about them to your style of playing, and <coughs> the things that you don't like, you, you redact, as they say in legalese. You reread it. You you, you you take them out of your mental thinking. Well, tell me this: um, where does uh, so-called formal training fit into this development? Uh, some say it really isn't necessary, some say it's an impediment, some say it enhances the ability to perform. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with people that say it's an impediment. I think that anything you can do to increase or to, um, uh, to enhance your, your, your ability to, to play, um, in other words, to improve your technique. For instance, uh, if, if whatever your style is, if it requires you to play a lot of single finger notes or single runs or whatever, you must have the technique available to do it. And the only way to do that, I think, is to either practice classics or practice a lot of skills, exercises, and so forth, to mm -hmm. develop the necessary technique to play that style that you want to play. Did the Almost whatever, it doesn't matter whatever style you want to play, you, you must have a certain amount of technique to do it. The only way to develop the technique is to practice exercises, scales, so forth, classics, to a certain extent. To, to what extent did the uh, European classics affect uh, the approach that you have to express yourself musically? I think maybe uh, in matters of form, I think that uh, if, if you go back far enough, uh, some of the, the rags that were played by Scott Joplin and some of the others probably had uh, the European, some of the European forms as a basis for their conception. And for instance, perhaps I can il maybe illustrate. I don't, know, I don't know whether this is a good illustration, but one of the Scott Joplin rags is a uh, maple leaf rag goes. That, that doesn't necessarily have to play at home, but there's another section that goes. And so forth. That is a, a second movement, you might say, to, uh, as, as opposed to the first movement. There is even a third movement that uh, follows that one. So in that respect, uh, that's why I said perhaps the form uh, was based on perhaps Euro European forms, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows for sure, you know. Well, for sure. That, We've run over possible. in this segment. We've got to take a break. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> Stay with us, and we'll, got, we'll be back with this master class with this master musician. To a certain extent. When I first uh, came to New York, I guess, 1944, latter part of 1944, uh, I worked in a group called uh, Hot Lips Page. Uh, he was a trumpet player, a blues trumpet player, and uh, I had to had to play a certain amount of boogie wiggy because it was popular in those days. You know? <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I I played it to his. I I never was very good at it, but uh, one thing it did for me was to make me more conscious of my left hand. You know, and the, 
the importance of the left hand because you had to play a lot of left hand uh, to play boogie woogie. You, you really didn't need much uh, a bass to accompany you, really. Uh, no, because you could you could you could play the you played the bass yourself, and of course you had the the equivalent left hand, you know, like all this sort of thing. Left hand side out. <laughs> another pianist uh, around in those days uh, out in um, Toledo, Ohio, um, named Art Tatum. Don't go down there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go down that I road. I think I jumped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me um, when you first uh, met Art and um, did you listen to his records? Were you listening to his records before you actually met him? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, as a matter of fact. And when I, the first time I heard Art, it was on a a radio broadcaster were playing some of his records in Detroit. And uh, when I first heard the record, I said, aha, they're trying something new and different. Uh, <laughs> there are three people playing the piano, and they obviously want us to believe that there's one person playing, but I know better than this because <laughs> no one person could play this. Right. It was Art Tatum. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was our first introduction to Art. Later, I met Art. We worked at, at uh, two different clubs in Buffalo. I worked at a club called the Anchor Bar. Art worked at a place called McVans. And our club closed earlier before his last set. So we would always go over and listen to Art's last set uh, well, before he left. And uh, he would play the last set, amazed everybody, absolutely just flabbergasted everybody as usual on a piano that it's impossible to understand how he could ever get a tone like it was a spinet type of piano instrument. As you know, spinets have short strings because they 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 only this sure, this sure, high. Sure. So it, with short strings, you cannot get the kind of tone that you get, let's say, from a, a grand or even a, a tall upright. Mm -hmm. Art used to make the spinet sound like a grand, you know, and I don't know how he did it. But anyway, <laughs> he's the only man I know that could do that. Later, he would go to a club. Uh, an after-hour spot where there was a piano or a restaurant or something, and they would play until 11 or 12 o'clock the next day. Bam, some just, you know, playing. Uh, so the significance of art would be uh, easy to understand on the part of anybody who's ever tried to play the piano. Mm. But what would you tell somebody who really has never touched a piano uh, would be the thing that made this man so extraordinary? Well, I guess, the fact, first of all, that he must have been born with a, a sort of innate talent or ability that is almost impossible or difficult if at most probably impossible to acquire in one lifetime. However, the other thing is that he painstakingly studied chords. He must have, he must have had a, a very uh, uh, extensive harmonic training before he started to play because he knew uh, all of the chords, all the chord changes, he knew all the substitutions, he knew everything there was to know about harmony. And he had the, the right hand, he had the ability to execute anything that he could think of, which was plenty. <laughs> and I, it, it, it always amazed me how he could coordinate his thoughts with the movements of his hands, because he was what I like to think of as making, doing inst instantaneous composition. He was, he was actually composing, because the things that he did, the improvisations that he made, were so well coordinated with his with his left hand and the harmony that you would think that it was written out, but nothing, at least not the way he played. None of his improvisations were written. Of course, by their very nature, they're they're not written. Improvisations are not written. But there's but, such a thing as head arrangements. Uh, yes, but he didn't use those so much. Uh, he may have used uh, sort of a nebulous form uh, to construct his uh, his playing around. Mm -hmm. I think everybody does that to a certain extent, but. Uh, the inner workings, all the chord, the chord changes, and the harmonies, and the subtle modulations, and all these things. These, these were 
instantaneous. You know. All right. We're out of time in another segment, but when we come back, would you give me an example of what you're talking about regarding this, this Our marvelous Tatum? man? Yes. I think it's time to meet Mike. We'll be back. Maybe. Stay with us. <laughs> I think that, <laughs> but you know, it gets, it gets more and more involved. Of course, as you know, that was a blues, you know, uh -huh. the beginning of a blues. But there was more to art than, um, well, to be blunt about, the man could get up and down the keyboard. Yes, the uh, yeah, I think you'd have to say that, you know, yeah. with, with the least effort that you've ever seen. You know, if you watched him play, it would seem as if his fingers just floated over the keys, you know, and uh, without any discernible effort. I mean, he was, he almost played effortlessly. You know, of course, that there was effort there, but it was so smooth and so, so well transmitted to the keys that it made it seem like it was just child's play. You know, that's, that's where he played. And so what impact did that have on your playing? I know it, it must have been kind of scary to hear. Well, uh, had I been there, when I think it was Illinois Jacket, uh, made the remark to uh, one of his colleagues who happened to be president, he had just heard I did him play in a club in Toledo. If I had been there when he said, don't go down there, because I, I would have taken his, uh, taken heed to his suggestion. I would not have gone down there. But yeah, I think anybody who's ever heard Art Tatum play has been influenced by his playing. There's no question about it. I don't see how you could possibly be otherwise. Uh, yeah. He's made such a great impact on, on, the, on the business. Did you work a lot with your brothers? Not an awful lot. Uh, Why was that? You know, I've never been able to answer that question. We, we did uh, one or two things together. We did, uh, what are you talking about? Dad, Elvin, and I. We did uh, one album, I think, for MGM, I believe, a company back in the mid-50s or mid-60s. Mm -hmm. But uh, other than that, you know, we never worked together. I think because our paths just went in different directions. You know, Elvin, mm -hmm. Dad went one way, Elvin went another, and I went another way. Mm -hmm. So we never, our paths never really crossed, which is rather unusual. Uh, what percentage of the work that you have done down the years is um, devoted to studio work? A great and deal. Reading of charts and things of that nature. Well, well, when you say studio, you mean uh, working for one of the mm, uh, a CBS, ABC, mm -hmm. or NBC? Yeah. Well, I was on staff at CBS for about 17 years. And during that period, uh, I had the opportunity to work on shows like the Gary Moore Show, the Jackie Gleason Show. Uh, the uh, uh, Gary Moore show and others that uh, didn't become as popular, uh, but that was that was a great deal of my experience. I also worked out of TV casting, and I used to play for auditions for singers, you know, and so forth. And did you do Broadway shows? Uh, uh, I did a Broadway show after that period, a show called uh, Copper and Brass, which had a very extensive run of two weeks on Broadway. <laughs> well, that's better than opening and closing the first night. Like some Tell me <laughs> about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> I also did another show called uh, Ain't Misbehaving. Oh, yes. Which ran for several years. And I think there may be companies out there still doing that show. You know? Yeah. It's a very popular show. Yeah. So of all the, the different venues that you've pursued with your, your great talent, uh, what has been the most satisfying? What do you prefer to do most? You just completed um, a concert uh, at Lincoln Center not mm -hmm. too long ago, and uh, you had a large orchestra, but you also did a solo piece there, mm -hmm. and you also did a piece within that program with a small group. Small group. What gives you the best, the best charge? Well, I'd have to say that perhaps working uh, in a small group format could either be a trio or a quartet, usually a trio, uh, mainly for the reason that uh, you have more of a chance to play. Uh, in a small group, there are only three people involved, bass, drums, and piano. So if you happen to be the leader, <laughs> you get to play a lot. I think that's good for you if you, uh, you know, if you like to play. Now, in the other formats, okay, a big band format is great uh, because, you, because you can 
in the case of the concert that we just did at Lincoln Center, I was able to play uh, many, all of my compositions, a lot of my compositions. In fact, all of the numbers on the program were mine except one. And uh, that's a great experience. Uh, you don't get a chance to do that too often, especially in a big band format of 40 pieces, more or less. So it was... Uh, that was but it's more thing. confining, isn't it? Because it, you really are locked into the score. That's true. And you, yes, you don't, you don't have as much freedom to improvise throughout as you would with a small group. All right, now, is a trio more satisfying to you than a duo with, just with the bass? Yes, Or I, have you ever worked with a guitar? Well, I've never worked with just, just a guitar and piano, but I've worked with a bass. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find that working with the bass, while it's satisfying up to a certain uh, point, uh, is not as satisfying as working with the trio, mm -hmm. because I, I think it's it's limiting uh, in a, in, a, in a certain sense because you don't have the rhythmic freedom that you would have working with the drum. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are only two instruments, the bass and the piano involved, well, if the bass is not playing rhythm and the piano isn't playing rhythm, then there's no rhythm there, so there's a pool there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, musically. Speaking. Some back to Tatum. Some uh, used to feel that. He was uh, impeded by playing with it with a trio. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to agree with that because I think that uh, certainly in Tatum's case, he was such, such he was the most consummate pianist that ever lived, as far as jazz is concerned. And uh, he didn't need any accompaniment. In fact, I think the fact that uh, if there was accompaniment working with him, it might have impeded his thinking, you know, because it was completely unnecessary with him. It was just not... You say that he was the, 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 the most complete pianist as far as jazz is concerned. Right. Why do you put that... Oh. <laughs> well, I, maybe in the context of uh, improvisation, maybe that's why I should have mentioned that. Uh, certainly, you see, classical pianists don't have the liberty to improvise. Uh, they must play things as they're written, pretty much, uh -huh. except for certain expressive things that they can do, uh, dynamics and so forth. But as far as the music itself is concerned, they must confine themselves to that. Well, a jazz pianist doesn't have to do that. In fact, if a jazz pianist does or not, doesn't do that, then he's probably a lot more effective, you know. I mean, he, he, if he limits himself to what's on the paper, he can't be very expressive. He's not really a jazz right. pianist. Right. Uh, I think the term implies that uh, you have a certain improvisational ability, certain creativity, that if it's, if it's not there, then you're not the complete jazz pianist. Well, Tatum had all of this. He had the creativity, he had the technique, uh, he had the ideas, he had the stamina, which is also very important. And he used them all, to right. a great degree. And we've used up all the time for this segment. Time flies. That's yours? No, that's the Alonius Monk. Oh, the Alonius Monk. It? Monk's mood. Monk's mood. Mm. It's gorgeous. Yes, I. Uh, that was really my introduction to Monk's uh, music because uh, when I first arrived in New York, uh, he invited me to his, uh, his apartment where he had a piano, and he he got me to write out this particular tune as he played it. So I had to write it, and as <laughs> exactly as he played it, and this is the way it was. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Uh, what, what do you have to say about the way music is going today, uh, in broad strokes? Well, you know, there, there are always people out there, you know, who 
are going in, let's say, the, a direction which they can, which they think is progressive and is leading music in a certain way that they think would be constructive in the long run. I, you see, but I sometimes have an argument with people uh, like that because I think that in order for music to be viable and be acceptable and to be understandable, after all, you're playing, you're not playing for yourself, you're playing for the people who possibly would be listeners, right? If the listeners cannot understand what you're doing or what you're trying to do, then I think the point is probably lost. So then I think that whatever is created should have uh, the aspects of music. It should have rhythm, harmony, and melody uh, to a more or less degree intermingled so that the effect is pleasing to the listener. If you don't have that, it seems to me it's partially lost. You're doing, perhaps you're moving in one direction the right way, perhaps too fast. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the final answer is, but I do know that uh, uh, if the music that you're playing gets beyond the point where listeners can enjoy it and understand it, then it seems to me that a lot of it is lost. You know? It's ineffectual. ineffectual. You're 80 now, uh, and you're playing better than ever before. And um, your compositions now are getting a lot of attention, not just now, but of late. Mm. It's, it's really been on the increase. What's ahead for Hank Jones? I'd like to continue doing what I'm doing. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to continue breathing at the same rate. <laughs> well, I, I figure if you can't breathe, well, no. <laughs> so, no, but I would like to continue really doing what I'm doing, just to do whatever I'm doing <laughs> better. You're really not well, Mr. I'm Jones. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not well. No, no. no but I mean, uh, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to really continue to do what I'm doing better than I, than I did it the last time. Right? Because I think you should always strive for improvement. If, if you can't make improvement, then you're standing still. If you're standing still, you're really losing ground because nothing mm -hmm. stands still, you know. Mm -hmm. So are you reaching for different styles and a different extension? Uh, you know, you have been known to have a particular sound and style. Uh, has it ever crossed your mind that you want to stretch out into other stratospheres and hemispheres? Well, you know, that occurred to me during the, uh, the thinking about this concert. See, uh, many of the things, many of the compositions that I, that I did, all of my compositions, uh, could have been elaborated on. They could have been stretched. They could have been enhanced, mm -hmm. made longer and so forth. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think if you go too far in that direction, you, you lose the initial mm -hmm. intent or the initial direction, uh, maybe perhaps the, the initial feel of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can always stretch things out. But in stretching them out, what do you do? Do you gain or do you lose? First of all, you, you, you make them longer. Now, if any of those pieces had been made longer, we wouldn't have had an opportunity to do as many as we did because <laughs> we were already cramped for a time. So I, I kept, that was in my mind. I, I, I'd like to do that. Someday I think I will. I think I'll enlarge on some of these compositions. And, uh, mm -hmm. But back to the small longer group. Form. Uh, back to the small group. Why is it that um, the changes for the tune, the chord changes for the tune, I've Got Rhythm, is so much a, a standard, a hallmark. Next to blues, I can't think of any other group of chord changes that are so, so fundamental. What is it about that song, I Got Rhythm? <laughs> it's hard to answer that. Uh, as you know, as you sort of hinted that, there have been many compositions based on I Got Rhythm chord yeah. changes. Uh, they're very simple changes. Maybe that's why. Uh, ah. I didn't, in, in this particular concert, I didn't, I didn't use any I Got Rhythm changes. But uh, uh, Would in you? the past, I have. Hmm? Would sorry. you? <laughs> you mean compose the tune right here? Would you? Or could just, you? Well, just well. Play, me, play me some rhythm. <laughs> See, what did I do? Here's I got rhythm. changes.
something like that. <laughs> something like that. Pretty much it. With some musicians, I think that's the rule, but uh, speaking for myself, I, I have to put in a certain number of hours, number of uh, practice hours at home. Really? Uh, you can't do it on the job, of course, and when you're on the road, it's even more difficult. Unless you carry a practice keyboard, which I do. I have a, a silent keyboard that I take on the road with me and practice, you know, various things. Silent, no sound. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, you have to, I have to, I feel that, personally, I have to try to maintain a certain fluency and a certain flexibility in my fingers, and the only way I can do it is by practicing away from, you know, away from the job. Mm -hmm. When you get to the job, you can't practice. By then, it's too late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> can I ask you some questions about stylists mm -hmm. of the day? Um, Bud Powell, what mm -hmm. was uh, noteworthy about his approach to the instrument? Well, of course, he uh, was a proponent of the single line style with the right hand. An hour okay. shoot of what Heinz had said. I think so. A lot of people think that Heinz was the, was the forerunner of the style. Uh, mm -hmm. That may or may not be true. I'm not sure. But I know that Bud certainly expanded on it. And uh, mm -hmm. not this is not to say that he did, didn't use his left hand, uh, but primarily uh, the focus was on his lines and figures with his right hand. Mm -hmm. you know, one one of the compositions that he did uh, that I particularly like is one called Hallucinations. Uh, it goes like uh, a little a little bit of this. Okay. Introduction to it. <laughs> 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 now, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned um, Thelonious Monk. Hmm. Someone who might hear his music and say, what's the big fuss about? Uh, he doesn't get up and down the keyboard like a Bud Powell or an Art Tatum. So what's all the fuss about? Because of his, uh, his voicing, uh, of course, his choice of chords. Uh, for instance, if you listen to uh, any pop tune, you listen to Stardust or... Uh, Body and Soul, mm -hmm. or uh, any, any song that you want, you will instantly recognize Monk's style because of his chords and the way he voices his chords. And this, the one, this one is a good example. You know, without getting too technical, it's just different. They just sound different than anybody else's chords. And you can always recognize his style. <laughs> where did where did it come from? Did you ever talk to him about his well, voicings? They were so unusual, you know. Yeah. I don't know whether his voicings. I know that uh, he comes from a very, uh, you might say, religious background. Now uh, you can hear uh, in his playing uh, sometimes little little snippets of gospel, you know, and here and there. So I think that's a part of it. I mean, that's sort of he, in other. He grew up hearing those things when he was a youngster. We, you and know, some of them, I found their way into his playing and his thinking, you know. Time is, is so adamant, 